Section 25 of The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Essence of Christianity by Ludwig Feuerbach. Translated from the German by Marian Evans. Chapter 20 The Contradiction in the Existence of God. Religion is the relation of man to his own nature. Therein lies its truth and its power of moral amelioration. But to his nature not recognized as his own, but regarded as another nature, separate, nay, contradistinguished from his own. Herein lies its untruth, its limitation, its contradiction to reason and morality. Herein lies the noxious source of religious fanaticism, the chief metaphysical principle of human sacrifices, in a word, the prima materia of all the atrocities, all the horrible scenes in the tragedy of religious history. The contemplation of the human nature as another, a separately existent nature, is, however, in the original conception of religion, an involuntary, childlike simple act of the mind that is one which separates god and man just as immediately as it again identifies them but when religion advances in years and with years in understanding when within the bosom of religion reflection on religion is awakened and the consciousness of the identity of the divine being with the human begins to dawn in a word when religion becomes theology the originally involuntary and harmless separation of god from man becomes an intentional excogitated separation which has no other object than to banish again from the consciousness this identity which has already entered there Hence, the nearer religion stands to its origin, the truer, the more genuine it is, the less is its true nature disguised. That is to say, in the origin of religion there is no qualitative or essential distinction whatever between God and man, and the religious man is not shocked at this identification, for his understanding is still in harmony with his religion. Thus, in ancient Judaism, Jehovah was a being differing from the human individual in nothing but in duration of existence. In his qualities, his inherent nature, he was entirely similar to man, had the same passions, the same human, nay, even corporeal properties. Only in the later Judaism was Jehovah separated in the strictest manner from man and recourse was had to allegory in order to give to the old anthropomorphisms another sense than that which they originally had so again in christianity in its earliest records the divinity of christ is not so decidedly stamped as it afterwards became with paul especially christ is still an undefined being hovering between heaven and earth between god and man or in general one amongst the existences subordinate to the highest the first of the angels the first created but still created begotten indeed for our sake but then neither are angels and men created but begotten for god is their father also the church first identified him with god made him the exclusive son of god defined his distinction from men and angels and thus gave him the monopoly of an eternal uncreated existence in the genesis of ideas the first mode in which reflection on religion or theology makes a divine being a distinct being and places him outside of man is by making the existence of god the object of a formal proof the proofs of the existence of god have been pronounced contradictory to the essential nature of religion they are so 
but only in their form as proofs religion immediately represents the inner nature of man as an objective external being and the proof aims at nothing more than to prove that religion is right the most perfect being is that than which no higher can be conceived god is the highest that man conceives or can conceive this premise of the ontological proof the most interesting proof because it proceeds from within expresses the inmost nature of religion that which is the highest for man from which he can make no further abstraction which is the positive limit of his intellect of his feeling of his sentiment that is to him god id quo nihil maius cogitare potest but this highest being would not be the highest if he did not exist we could then conceive a higher being who would be superior to him in the fact of existence the idea of the highest being directly precludes this fiction not to exist is a deficiency to exist is perfection happiness bliss from a being to whom man gives all offers up all that is precious to him he cannot withhold the bliss of existence the contradiction to the religious spirit in the proof of the existence of god lies only in this that the existence is thought of separately and thence rises the appearance that god is a mere conception a being existing in idea only an appearance however which is immediately dissipated for the very result of the proof is that to god belongs an existence distinct from an ideal one an existence apart from man apart from thought a real self-existence the proof therefore is only thus far discordant with the spirit of religion that it presents as a formal deduction the implicit enthymem or immediate conclusion of religion exhibits in logical relation and therefore distinguishes what religion immediately unites for to religion god is not a matter of abstract thought he is a present truth and reality but that every religion in its idea of god makes a latent unconscious inference is confessed in its polemic against other religions ye heathens says the jew or the christian were able to conceive nothing higher as your deities because ye were sunk in sinful desires your god rests on a conclusion the premises of which are your sensual impulses your passions you thought thus the most excellent life is to live out one's impulses without restraint and because this life was the most excellent the truest you made it your god your god was your carnal nature your heaven is a free theatre for the passions which in society and in the conditions of actual life generally had to suffer restraint but naturally in relation to itself no religion is conscious of such an inference for the highest of which it is capable is its limit has the force of necessity is not a thought not a conception but immediate reality the proofs of the existence of god have for their aim to make the internal external to separate it from man his existence being proved god is no longer a merely relative but a noumenal being ding an sich he is not only a being for us a being in our faith our feeling our nature he is a being in himself a being external to us in a word not merely a belief a feeling a thought but also a real existence apart from belief feeling and thought but such an existence is no other than a sensational existence i e an existence conceived according to the forms of our senses the idea of sensational existence is indeed already involved in the characteristic expression external to us 
it is true that a sophistical theology refuses to interpret the word external in its proper natural sense and substitutes the indefinite expression of independent separate existence but if the externality is only figurative the existence also is figurative and yet we are here only concerned with existence in the proper sense and external existence is alone the definite real unshrinking expression for separate existence real sensational existence is that which is not dependent on my own mental spontaneity or activity but by which i am involuntarily affected which is when i am not when i do not think of it or feel it the existence of god must therefore be in space in general a qualitative sensational existence but god is not seen not heard not perceived by the senses he does not exist for me if i do not exist for him if i do not believe in a god there is no god for me if i am not devoutly disposed if i do not raise myself above the life of the senses he has no place in my consciousness thus he exists only in so far as he is felt thought believed in the addition for me is unnecessary his existence therefore is a real one yet at the same time not a real one a spiritual existence says the theologian but spiritual existence is only an existence in thought in feeling in belief so that his existence is a medium between sensational existence and conceptional existence a medium full of contradiction or he is a sensational existence to which however all the conditions of sensational existence are wanting consequently an existence at once sensational and not sensational an existence which contradicts the idea of the sensational or only a vague existence in general which is fundamentally a sensational one but which in order that this may not become evident is divested of all the predicates of a real sensational existence but such an existence in general is self-contradictory to existence belongs full definite reality a necessary consequence of this contradiction is atheism the existence of god is essentially an empirical existence without having its distinctive marks it is in itself a matter of experience and yet in reality no object of experience it calls upon man to seek it in reality it impregnates his mind with sensational conceptions and pretensions hence when these are not fulfilled when on the contrary he finds experience in contradiction with these conceptions he is perfectly justified in denying that existence kant is well known to have maintained in his critique of the proofs of the existence of god that the existence is not susceptible of proof from reason he did not merit on this account the blame which was cast upon him by hegel the idea of the existence of god in those proofs is a thoroughly empirical one but i cannot deduce an empirical existence from an a priori idea the only real ground of blame against kant is that in laying down this position he supposed it to be something remarkable whereas it is self-evident reason cannot constitute itself an object of sense i cannot in thinking at the same time represent what i think is a sensible object external to me the proof of the existence of god transcends the limits of reason 
true but in the same sense in which sight hearing smelling transcend the limits of reason it is absurd to reproach reason that it does not satisfy a demand which can only address itself to the senses existence empirical existence is proved to me by the senses alone and in the question as to the being of god the existence implied has not the significance of inward reality of truth but the significance of a formal external existence hence there is perfect truth in the allegation that the belief that god is or is not has no consequence with respect to inward moral dispositions it is true that the thought there is a god is inspiring but here the is means inward reality here the existence is not a movement of inspiration an act of aspiration just as error just in proportion as this existence becomes a prosaic and empirical truth the inspiration is extinguished religion therefore in so far as it is founded on the existence of god as an empirical truth is a matter of indifference to the inward disposition as necessarily in the religious cultus ceremonies observances sacraments apart from the moral spirit or disposition become in themselves an important fact so also at last belief in the existence of god becomes apart from the inherent quality the spiritual import of the idea of god a chief point in religion if thou only believest in god believest that god is thou art already saved whether under this god thou conceivest a really divine being or a monster a nero or a caligula an image of thy passions thy revenge or ambition it is all one the main point is that thou be not an atheist the history of religion has amply confirmed this consequence which we here draw from the idea of the divine existence if the existence of god taken by itself had not rooted itself as a religious truth in minds there would never have been those infamous senseless horrible ideas of god which stigmatize the history of religion and theology the existence of god was a common external and yet at the same time a holy thing what wonder then if on this ground the commonest rudest most unholy conceptions and opinions sprang up atheism was supposed and is even now supposed to be the negation of all moral principle of all moral foundations and bonds if god is not all distinction between good and bad virtue and vice is abolished thus the distinction lies only in the existence of god the reality of virtue lies not in itself but out of it and assuredly it is not from an attachment to virtue from a conviction of its intrinsic worth and importance that the reality of it is thus bound up with the existence of god on the contrary the belief that god is the necessary condition of virtue is the belief in the nothingness of virtue in itself it is indeed worthy of remark that the idea of the empirical existence of god has been perfectly developed in modern times in which empiricism and materialism in general have arrived at their full blow it is true that even in the original simple religious mind god is an empirical existence to be found in a place though above the earth but here this conception 
has not so naked, so prosaic a significance. The imagination identifies again the external God with the soul of man. The imagination is, in general, the true place of an existence which is absent, not present, to the senses, though nevertheless sensational in its essence. Only the imagination solves the contradiction in an existence which is at once sensational and not sensational. Only the imagination is the preservative form from atheism. In the imagination, existence has sensational effects. Existence affirms itself as a power. With the essence of sensational existence, the imagination associates also the phenomena of a sensational existence. Where the existence of God is a living truth, an object on which the imagination exercises itself, there also appearances of God are believed in. Where, on the contrary, the fire of the religious imagination is extinct, where the sensational effect or appearances necessarily connected with an essentially sensational existence cease, there the existence becomes a dead, self-contradictory existence, which falls irrevocably into the negation of atheism. The belief in the existence of God is the belief in a special existence, separate from the existence of man and nature. A special existence can only be proved in a special manner. The faith is therefore only then a true and living one, when special effects, immediate appearances of God, miracles are believed in. Where, on the other hand, the belief in God is identified with the belief in the world, where the belief in God is no longer a special faith, where the general being of the world takes possession of the whole man, there also vanishes the belief in special effects and appearances of God. Belief in God is wrecked, is stranded on the belief in the world, in natural effects as the only true ones. And here the belief in miracles is no longer anything more than the belief in historical, past miracles. So the existence of God is also only an historical, in itself, atheistic conception. End of section 25